Now the third idea, after computation and evolution, is specialization. I don't think there's ever going to be a theory of everything when it comes to human thought and feeling. I don't think the brain is made of some wonder tissue that can uh, immediately explain everything that we think and feel. I don't think there'll be some magical set of equations or single computer model that will do it all. And that's because the mind solves many different kinds of problems. Seeing in three dimensions, moving arms and legs, understanding the physical world, finding and keeping mates, securing allies, and many others. These are different kinds of problems, and the tools for solving them are bound to be different. We know that specialization is ubiquitous in biology. The heart is different from the lungs because the heart is an organ for pumping blood and the lungs are a device for oxygenating blood and an organ that is good at one is necessarily going to be bad at the other. And this specialization goes all the way down. Heart tissue is different from lung tissue. Heart cells are different from lung cells. Many of the molecules of making up heart cells are different from those making up lung cells. And I suspect that the same is going to be true of the circuitry of the brain, that the brain is going to be organized into the mental equivalent of systems, organs, tissues, and so on. So putting these three ideas together, uh, the, what I suggest is a fruitful way of understanding the mind is that the mind is a system of organs of computation that allowed our ancestors to understand and outsmart objects, animals, plants, and one another. And I'll illustrate this idea now by two concrete examples, one from how we perceive the world and the other from the world of emotions. Let me begin with uh, the um, problem of uh, perception, in particular the problem of vision. When you go to the movies and see a director's idea of a robot, the problem of vision is sometimes conveyed to the audience by showing the world from the robot's eye view using some kind of cinematic uh, distortion. Perhaps, it's, as in the Terminator, there'll be a wide-angle view with crosshairs and pull-down menus. Or in 2001, there'll be a, a red tint and a fish-eye view. Uh, but this is quite misleading, because you have to ask who or what inside the robot is looking at that display, uh, who's reading the menu or looking at the crosshairs. Obviously, there isn't a little man inside the robot narrating to the robot what it sees. A better way of thinking about the problem of vision is to imagine that the input to vision is a massive spreadsheet with a million numbers corresponding to the light brightnesses of each point in the visual field, the entire spreadsheet coming about as a result of a projection that's formed when light bounces off objects and is focused by the cornea and the lens of the eye onto the two-dimensional retina, at which point it, the pattern of light is transduced into a million neural signals. The job of the rest of the brain is to crunch those numbers and to recover a, an understanding of the three-dimensional structure of the world from the patterns that are implicit in those million numbers. Now, the brain has evolved many tricks for recovering three-dimensional shapes from the two-dimensional retinal array. And I'll just talk about one of them called shape from shading. It relies on a uh, basic principle of physics that the shallower the angle of a surface with respect to a light source, the less light it reflects back. And just to illustrate that, I don't know if you can see this, but as I tilt the card with respect to the flashlight, the beam of light changes from a bright concentrated spot to a much more diffuse uh, area that's uh, smeared across the surface and which is therefore necessarily dimmer. Now that has nothing to do with the mind, that's just a law of physics, but the mind has evolved a trick that exploits that law of physics by basically running it backwards. The dimmer a patch on the retina, the shallower the angle of the surface. And with that trick, the brain can reconstruct a three-dimensional surface from the thousands of facets whose surface angle is estimated from the brightness on the retina. That's what would allow us, for example, to tell the difference between a ping pong ball and a white poker chip from the subtle pattern of shading across the surface. However, in interpreting brightness as coming from differences in angle, the, this algorithm in the brain makes an assumption about the world. 
basically that the world is like this, a homogeneous gray card, uh, and that it predicts that if that violation, that assumption is violated, if we're in a world uh, in which lightness is not ran uniformly or randomly distributed across the surface, our shape from shading module should be fooled into seeing shapes that aren't there. Now this isn't just a theoretical prediction, but it happens all the time. One example is television. If an alien scientist were to come to this planet, they would surely be astonished to discover that the typical member of our society spends six hours a day staring at a piece of glass in front of a box. Well, why do we do it? Well, it's because the box has been engineered to deliver a highly non-random pattern of shading across the surface of the glass, unlike the gray card, that the brain, assuming uh, a, a constant lightness, interprets as having come from complicated three-dimensional structures. And for that reason, we hallucinate a 3D world behind the pane of glass. Another example is makeup. Uh, people who are skilled in applying makeup know that if you uh, apply some uh, blush to the sides of the nose, the eye of the beholder will interpret darker surface as a uh, steeper surface, and that will make the nose, the sides of the nose look more parallel, and the nose will look smaller. Conversely, if you put light powder on the upper lip, the eye of the beholder will interpret light surface as more perpendicular surface, and that gives rise to that full-lipped, pouty look that the models strive for. But I bring up these examples to make a more general point, which is that many of the illusions, fallacies, and maladaptive behaviors that we see in humans may not come from fundamental design flaws, but rather from a mismatch. A mismatch between assumptions about an ancestral world built into our mental faculties, such as that surfaces are uniformly or randomly colored, and the structure of the current world, such as television or makeup, which deliberately violates those assumptions. And I think this sheds light on uh, what would otherwise be puzzles for biology, such as why people eat themselves into an early grave with too much junk food, use contraception, which when you think of it as a form of Darwinian suicide, you're taking act active steps to prevent your genes from propagating, or gambling and buying lottery tickets, uh, sometimes known as the stupidity tax. <laughs> well, I think the answer is that our mental faculties assume a world in which sweet foods are nutritious, which is true of the world that we evolved in, in which the only sweet foods came from were basically ripe fruit, uh, until the invention of agriculture, which violated that assumption by churning out tons of uh, sweet foods that were not nutritious. It assumes a world in which sex leads to babies, uh, which again was true of the world we evolved in until the very recent invention of reliable contraception, and a world in which statistical patterns have underlying causes, uh, again, which is true of the world almost by definition, with the exception of machines that are engineered precisely to display statistical patterns without any causes, namely, namely uh, gambling machines. Okay, let me turn now to uh, an example of our emotional uh, life, and I'll begin with a, uh, a puzzle. Why are our emotions about other people uh, often passionate and seemingly irrational? Examples would be uh, pursuing vengeance until the day you die far out of uh, proportion to the initial injury, uh, defending your honor with duels and other public displays, falling head over heels in love and offering to slay dragons and uh, losing your appetite and so on. The traditional theory for human passion, it comes out of the Romantic movement 200 years ago. The Romantic theory is that all of us house a primal force part of our legacy from nature that's fundamentally irrational and maladaptive unless it's channeled into art and creativity. And again, that brings up the hydraulic metaphor that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. Well, I'm going to uh, present a very different theory that comes from a number of economists and game theorists that I'll call the strategic theory, coming out of the uh, theory of paradoxical tactics that a sacrifice of freedom and rationality can paradoxically give an agent an advantage in promises, threats, and bargains, cases in which two parties have 
both overlapping and distinct interests. Just to illustrate how unromantic this theory is, I'm going to use it to reverse engineer romantic love. Now, as it happens, romantic love has been studied uh, for several decades by social psychologists and uh, um, sociologists who have um, told us that there's actually a rational component to uh, romantic attraction. Basically, smart shopping. As anyone who has recently been in the single scene will attest, uh, love is a kind of marketplace where all of us at some point in our lives have been in search of the uh, richest, best looking, nicest, smartest person who will settle for us. 